By 1950, there were powerful criminal organizations operating across the United States, but the average American didn't really believe that organized crime was yet a problem. That began to change when Senator Estes Kefauver from Tennessee organized the Kefauver Committee to investigate the impact of organized crime on interstate commerce and American society. The committee traveled to 14 cities and conducted 27 hearings between 1950 and 1951. Here in Las Vegas, right here in this courthouse, we hosted the Kefauver Committee on November 15, 1950. During a half-day hearing, the Kefauver Committee spoke to mobsters connected to casinos here in Las Vegas, as well as around the United States. I'm standing here in one of my favorite rooms at the Mob Museum, our historic courtroom. This is the room in which the Kefauver Committee conducted their Las Vegas hearing on November 15, 1950. The courtroom has been restored to exactly how it appeared on that day. Preservation architects worked to ensure that the room is faithful to its appearance at the time. That included doing paint chip analysis to return to the original paint colors and working on the historic fixtures. We are also lucky that we have the original judges and clerks benches here in the room, which makes it even more realistic. The Kefauver Committee came to Las Vegas and heard testimony from seven people. Of those seven, Wilbur Clark, who owned the Desert Inn with Mo Daylitz, Mo Sedway, who was the manager at the time of the Flamingo, and Nevada Lieutenant Governor Cliff Jones all testified. In 1931, the Nevada legislature passed a bill that became known as the Wide Open Gambling Bill. This allowed casinos to operate across the state of Nevada, and this encouraged mobsters to come and get a piece of the action. By the 1940, mobsters were moving into the state from Los Angeles, New York, Cleveland, and other cities around the country. One of those early groups of people were the associates of Bugsy Siegel and Meyer Lansky from New York. They became involved with the project known as the Flamingo. If you've seen the movie Bugsy, you're probably under the impression that Bugsy created the city of Las Vegas, and that's not true. He didn't even really create the project of the Flamingo. That was a man named Billy Wilkerson, whose photo you can see in this case before me. Billy Wilkerson came to Las Vegas to build what would become the most opulent resort in Las Vegas at the time, the Flamingo. And as he began to run out of money, he asked investors from the mob, including Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel, to get involved. Bugsy Siegel took over the project completely, and he began spending millions in order to make it a gorgeous resort. The resort opened on December 26, 1946, and for those first guests, they were given these pink ceramic flamingos that you can see here in the case. The problem was, the resort really wasn't ready for guests. It had been raining the last few days in Southern California and Nevada, and many of the guests found it challenging to get here to the city. And for those who did make it on time, they realized that their rooms at the Flamingo weren't ready, and many of them were forced to stay in neighboring hotels. The Flamingo closed, and it took a few months before they reopened. The Flamingo reopened in March of 1947, and almost immediately began to turn a profit. But that wasn't enough to save Bugsy Siegel, whose relationship with Meyer Lansky and the rest of his New York associates had begun to sour. On June 20th, 1947, Bugsy Siegel was found dead in the home of his girlfriend, Virginia Hill, in Beverly Hills. In 1967, reclusive and mysterious billionaire Howard Hughes purchased the Desert Inn from mobster Mo Daylitz. This started a six-hotel buying spree that continued until 1969. The year before, Hughes had moved into the penthouse of the Desert Inn, and he really helped nudge the mob out of town and usher in a new age of corporate ownership. The objects in this case are connected to many of the properties that he owned, including uh, chips from the Landmark, an ashtray from the Castaways, and a photo and check from the Silver Slipper. In the 1920s, Nevada became the first state to authorize the use of lethal gas in executions. The first criminal who was executed using this method was Ji Zhong, a member of a Chinese criminal Tong who had killed a rival in northern Nevada. The gas chamber chair in front of me was used in the Nevada gas chamber in the prison system from 1951 until the 1980s when the method of execution was changed to lethal injection. 
Here in our Mobs Greatest Hits gallery, we talk about the violent side of organized crime. And a great example of that violent side is Roy DeMeo, who was a prolific hitman for the Gambino family in New York in the 1970s and 80s. Here on display, we have a machete and ice pick that belong to Roy DeMeo. When we first received this donation to the museum, we actually had both of these weapons tested by the Las Vegas Metro Police Department's forensic unit to see whether red staining on both weapons was in fact blood. Unfortunately, once we had the tests done, it was inconclusive and, and they said that there was no evidence that it was actually human blood on the weapons. And Really, it's challenging to get human blood uh, evidence after 30 years, but we're still very excited to have these objects that belong to a man who was responsible for uh, purportedly about a hundred murders as a part of his reign with the Gambino family in the 70s and 80s. An example of an unsuccessful mob hit was that of Frank Lefty Rosenthal here in Las Vegas, not too far from where we are at the Mob Museum. Within a parking lot of a Tony Roma's, he had left his car as he met his friends for dinner. When he got back to his car and went to start his ignition, it ignited a bomb that had been placed underneath the vehicle. Lucky for him, on this particular model of Cadillac Eldorado, there had been a metal plate placed underneath the driver's seat, which caused the bomb to shoot out from beneath the car instead of igniting it as it normally would have, which allowed him to survive the blast. Many people believe that Tony Spilatro, a fellow member of the Chicago Outfit and a former friend of Frank Lefty Rosenthal's, might have been involved with the bombing, but no one's ever been able to prove who actually put the bomb under his car.